Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, back. Good to see everybody. And uh, just a quick personal update. I got tested last week and I was undetected, but nevertheless, I'm still feeling a little bit under the weather. So um, I'd rather be gardening than napping, but it's um, where we are right now. But I think I can make it through this meeting, no problem. Um, we are here today to talk about what is now called S-333, which is the bill uh, providing some eviction or ejectment protection moratorium language that has been worked on that we've been working on since we left the building. Um, it passed the Senate with um, some changes to what we sent them. Um, if you remember correctly, we sent them our, the language that we had worked on. It was not a full bill. It was just the language. It was a draft, if you will. And they took that language and turned it into S-333. Um, David Hall is here to take us through that bill. And we're also joined today by Senator, or Senator, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mike. Um, Representative Mike Marcotte, from, who's the chair of the Commerce Committee. Um, but uh, just very quickly on other housekeeping stuff, we are still um, working with the status quo. We will continue to hear this and get it prepared for a committee vote, um, hopefully this week, but perhaps as early, you know, may have to wait until next week. I'm still waiting to hear on the process. I think you may have all received an email this morning from Catherine Lavasser about training that's going to be going on this week. We've all been assigned a set time over the next several days to um, go on Zoom and deal with the Everbridge training, which we received from, from Chief Romai last week um, to try to have some test runs. And she's, she's scheduled us in such a way that there's never going to be a, a quorum of any particular committee so that we can meet uh, in numbers, but that's gonna be spread out over four days. So um, if you haven't seen that, check that out. That'll, that'll be happening when we're not on a, um, a Zoom call for our own meeting. We're scheduled tomorrow at one o'clock where I'm sure we'll pick this up again, this, this bill again, because um, that's really what we have cooking right now. So with that, um, uh, same rules as, as always, if you wish to speak, um, press the raise your hand button and I'll try to get you um, I, I've got the participant list here on my screen and when and when your time comes I'll let you know and I'll unmute you or you'll unmute yourself and then we'll go from there so David I'd like to just um, just pass it to you and just if you can give us a, a quick rundown of of what happened to the bill when it went to the Senate and how they created what we have in front of us. And you provided us with a very good annotation as well. That's been posted on our website um, for us to look at. Is that the best thing to look at for, for the committee? I think so. I think that would be um, easier for you all to be able to see just what the few changes are. Okay, so if everybody has access to that at home, um, I don't know, David, if you want to put that up or not, um, but basically, um, so basically when we, when we left, when we last left you, we had sent them a bill that had several elements of which they took out some. And, and the main thing is that they kept, um, they kept the um, ejectment portion. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. All right. So, so um, all yours. All right, thank you. Your, for your record, uh, my name is David Hall. I'm an attorney with Legislative Council of Staff Housing and Other Issues. Um, <clears throat> so as the chair indicated, you had sent, shared with the Senate Committee on Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs um, draft language you had worked through since early March, um, culminating in your draft 11.1, .1, which at that point um, included some family leave provisions um, an appropriation and uh, guidance to the Department of Children and Families on how to spend money to provide housing assistance. And then your section nine, you may recall, um, had the various provisions relating to moratoria concerning ejectment actions and foreclosure actions. Um, at the time, the chair of this committee also communicated uh, sort of a soft position that you, you all were not uh, prepared to, you know, endorse 
a particular dollar number or a particular investment strategy, but wanted to continue that conversation. Um, and also that you uh, had worked closely with stakeholders, including legal aid and the Landlords Association to arrive at a consensus proposal, which uh, the, the Senate committee then picked up and worked on over the course of a week or more. And the Senate ultimately did pass last week this version. So they used as a vehicle, uh, a bill that was on the wall in Senate Economic Development S-333, which they proposed to be renamed to an act relating to establishing a moratorium on ejectment and foreclosure actions during the COVID-19 emergency. Um, there are not too many changes, uh, but you have here on the screen and also posted to your committee page, um, this version, this annotated version that I prepared, and there's two sets of sort of annotations in it. So yellow highlights reflect changes that the Senate has made relative to your draft 11.1. .1. And then there are two pieces that are green, which uh, are the, the product of the, the um, communications the chair referenced earlier concerning foreclosures in particular uh, foreclosures of abandoned properties, non-occupied properties. So um, with that, let me just quickly take you through this. I just included the seven and eight with the strike through to show you that recall that was the piece that had the $5 million live appropriation. And then section eight was the charge to GCF, DHCD and others about what services they would need to provide um, that discussion is ongoing in the Senate. Um, I assume it will be part of your appropriations discussions in the House. Um, like you, they have looked at uh, preliminarily what funding might be available under the federal law and the Regent CARES Act to help provide some of this assistance. Um, the housing sector, as with most others, uh, still awaiting a lot of guidance from Treasury and others on how the money can be spent, how it will flow exactly, how much of Vermont will get. That work is still in progress. Um, but for the moment, those parts are not in the Senate bill. And so it would start with their section one, which was your section nine. <clears throat> and uh, the format's the same, the construct's the same. They begin with definitions. Their definition of emergency period is the same. It starts with the declaration on March 13th. It runs for 30 days following termination by declaration. They did add in this new subdivision to a, a definition of ejectment. And it refers to an ejectment action brought under 9 VSA chapter 137 and 12 VSA chapter 169 against the tenant of a residential dwelling unit. So the purpose here, you may recall in your discussions, you had broached the subject of whether this bill would apply to commercial leases. And that was something that the Senate was going to pursue further. Um, after some testimony from the Chamber of Commerce and others, certainly recognizing the problems inherent uh, and unique to commercial leases relative to residential leases, um, the Senate for now has chosen to limit the scope of this bill specifically to residential rental agreements. So consequently, subdivision two here by defining ejectment uh, in terms of the residential rental agreement chapter um, and specifically saying against the tenant of a residential dwelling unit makes clear that the scope of the bill is, as to ejectment actions is limited to residential. Any questions? I see Representative Troiano popped up as having a question on my screen. All right, here we go. Hold on a sec. <clears throat> Trying to unmute you, Chip. I there you go. Now. You're on. Okay. So I guess a <clears throat> question here is that um, uh, was the dis was it discussed that um, this the small business um, loan and grant. Uh, uh, availability um, it was something that caused the Senate to strike commercial properties from this uh, David is that something that happened in the discussion I mean they they started to explore uh, those issues certainly recognize that businesses do have the at least not only have the opportunity to avail themselves of some of the 
emergency funds and PPP funds that are available, though those programs are struggling to uh, function, honestly. Um, but truthfully, the, 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 I think it's fair to say that the, the thrust of this bill was primarily residential and was to protect people from being dispossessed from their homes and that to bring in, um, to bring commercial leases into it adds a level of complexity uh, that they had not had enough testimony to address. And then frankly, um, there was an acknowledgement that uh, you know, there may not be much the state can do. At least that was the testimony of the Chamber of Commerce. They certainly flagged the risk of, uh, in particular, personal guarantees that uh, often go along with commercial leases and how, you know, that really is an issue that has a lot of potential for harm to the economy. Even if a business goes out of business, the proprietor will still be personally liable for the yeah. lease um, no easy answers to that. And uh, I think it's fair to say they just wanted to try to keep the focus on residential just to get this bill moving and out of the body and then continue to work on business related issues in other contexts. Okay. Understood. Thank you, David. Sure. <clears throat> Shall I move forward? Please do. So the next piece in green, uh, foreclosure definition, there is the definition that you already had. It's a foreclosure action brought under uh, chapter uh, 172 of title 12, um, dwelling house as it's defined there. The piece that's in green and bracketed is uh, the subject is one of the two pieces that relate to um, the, the correspondence from the banks and, and representative Marcotte and uh, the intention here, the goal, the purpose is to clarify that we're talking about foreclosure actions of against occupied properties. So, you know, there's no one way to do this, but this is kind of a clean and easy way to just to, to add to the definition and therefore throughout the bill, wherever we say foreclosure, uh, whether it's in the context of pending future actions, it's in the context of risk of possession or otherwise, we're talking about properties that are occupied by the borrower. We're not talking about unoccupied or abandoned properties. And I'll leave it to others to debate, you know, how far this should go and whether this is sufficient language, but I flag it here for, for you to know uh, that that's one of the issues under consideration. And I and I want to take a minute here, David, to bring Mike and uh, Representative Marcotte in, and just um, Mike, if you could, uh, Representative Marcotte, if you could just give us a quick rundown of what you received. I mean, we all ended up um, several chairs received uh, a an email from an attorney that was posted on our website. But if you could give a rundown and and what your committee discussed on this issue. Sure. Um, for the record, uh, Representative Michael Marcotte from. Coventry Chair of House Commerce and Economic Development. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we, we took a, uh, a look at the foreclosure piece to this. And um, in my committee, we talked about, um, we had a discussion with, with um, uh, Chris Delia from the Vermont Bankers Association. Um, I think what, what, he, what he discussed with us was whether or not there is a real need for um, this legislation now because the courts have already taken care of um, evictions and foreclosures in their memo um, that's gone out to the courts, um, prohibiting any, any of that from happening um, until, we're, until they, they say so. Um, I think one piece that's in, that's in the memo would still allow for um, unoccupied dwellings for foreclosure to continue on with those. Um, but in the legislation that is before you now, um, that is not there. So it would be a blanket uh, prohib uh, prohibiting um, any foreclosures um, on, uh, on uh, any dwelling. So um, I received a communication yesterday from Susan Steckel and uh, she's a 
um, a lawyer who deals in foreclosures uh, with um, just asking if we could do something um, just to make sure that unoccupied dwellings could continue to go through. Um, and so I reached out to, uh, to Chris Delia. He agreed with that assessment. And also uh, in the afternoon, I received a communication from Community National Bank um, up here in Derby. And um, they, they, um, they feel the same way that uh, we wanna make sure that we don't, um, don't stop um, those foreclosures on unoccupied dwellings. And so this was a um, literally a simple one line fix that your committee worked on. Well, it's actually I worked on it. Um, I sent it out to my committee yesterday asking for comments. Um, I think everyone that I heard from back except for one member who was um, just concerned about um, allowing foreclosures, uh, allowing foreclosures at all. We shouldn't be doing that, but everybody else was was in favor of of this um, this action, um, this amendment. Okay, um, Tommy, you had your hand up. Yes, I don't know if this is splitting hairs, but I'm wondering about the language specifically saying occupied by the borrower. What if it's occupied by somebody else? So. Wouldn't it be cleaner if you just said it was occupied and not specifying by whom? I'm I'm fine with that. Um, I leave that up to you and and to um, David to figure that piece of it out. But I think that's that's the intent is that um, we certainly don't want anyone um, to be put out on the street. So anyone that's that's in a building that that's foreclosed on, um, we don't want them out. But if it's if it's a vacant building. Um, then, then the proceedings should be able to continue to go forward. So I, I agree with you, Tommy. Yeah, I suggest that we just say occupied and not worry about who it is who's in there, because we all want the same thing. We, we're not trying to put people out on the street. Right. Thank you. Right. Um, Chip. Uh, yeah, the uh, the the last piece of that has some concern for me also as primary resident. Now, what does that do to uh, rental units and landlords, who I understand we are also trying to protect, um, because if they are exposed to are exposed, then um, it could filter down onto the uh, renters in, in that piece of property. So again, I you know I would think. Um, just um, loan agreement um, as a residence rather than primary residence, because that indicates to me that um, uh, primary residence would suggest that uh, it's occupied by the borrower. However, um, I think however you, the committee um, wants to go, I think we're all in agreement. I, I agree with you. So um, I think you can work that out with David. Yeah. Um, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I mean, it's understood that they, what the task is here is that uh, we don't displace families during this crisis. Right. I think we're all in agreement there. So a little piece of language that assures that that um, is exactly what happens as a result of this, I think is important. And I think this really shows out the fine line we're talking here between residential and commercial, because of course, you know, we talked about this early on about commercial landlord. We don't want to see commercial landlords be foreclosed upon, thereby having seven or eight tenants in a department building kicked out on the street. But, um, but yeah, there's a fine line here between what we're trying to do is protect the people who are on, who are the, who are the renters at the same time, as um, I think what the bank is asking is, and what the attorney was asking for is that in, in specific that there were several, or at least at least one, perhaps several um, occasions where there was a foreclosure, either, uh, either a mutually agreed foreclosure or a foreclosure on vacant properties. And I think that's what we're talking about here specifically. Um, so how we get there with the language is, is the finesse right now. I agree on with that. Um, do, well, uh, John, you have your hand up. Chip, do you have your hand up again or? No, I took it down. Okay. 
John, you're on. Yes, uh, Representative Marcotte, I'm, I'm wondering, you had said judiciary had, was it statewide? They talked about not doing foreclosures or was it just in the five counties? Because last week when we heard testimonies, only five of the counties that uh, said that they were looking for some kind of overall structure uh, from legislature. But are you saying this is not needed now? No, I'm just wondering if it is needed or not. Okay. And then I wonder if in the counties that have stopped evictions, the foreclosures, what they're doing with um, this abandoned property as well, if, if that's excluded from that, because the courts are pretty much closed now. And, and the, way, the way I read the memo, I, th I think that um, a motion could be filed to continue those. I, yes, okay, that's that, uh, thank you. Thanks. All right. Anything further, um, Chris? Do you want to add anything right now, or do you want to hold off for the time being? No, I can. I can do it right now if that's appropriate, sir. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, first of all, let me uh, <laughs> let me start with an apology because in the normal course of action, when we're not dealing with trying to roll out a paycheck protection program, this is an issue that um, I would have put on the table given the number of hearings that you had. But honestly, my mind is elsewhere trying to get that moving along. So I appreciate Sue and, and uh, Sue Steckel and Beth Moore bringing it up over the weekend. And I appreciate Representative Marcotte being willing to put it on the table. Uh, it, it is, it's just fundamentally very simple. If you've got a vacant property, and that's all this is focusing on, that has already gone through the process or potentially going through the process, that vacant property sitting out there can become a, a growing liability as far as the cost, maintenance, security, uh, people who use it for illegal purposes, as we've seen in some instances. So the sooner we can move that vacant property along, the better off, not, the inst not only the institution, but the community in general. So I think Sue, and Beth, rightly so, focusing on if we've already got those in the works, don't let a global moratorium on foreclosure prevent those from going through. So that's why they brought it to their attention. I thank them. I thank you for your willingness to consider it. We are only talking about vacant properties, even in the, in the case of rentals. If there were renters in there, we're not gonna move forward with a foreclosure and throw the renters out. This is strictly vacant properties that they're focusing on. So I appreciate any willingness to consider this amendment and just uh, be more surgical in the overall approach of the, of the bill itself. Happy okay. to take questions. Any questions for Chris? No, thank you, Chris, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, David. All right. <clears throat> um, okay, so everybody can see the screen again. I'm in subsection B. Um, you may recall this was uh, sort of the articulation of duties that continue uh, regardless of the bill, people still have to pay rent, people still have to pay rent into court, people still have to make their mortgage payments. Um, and then B4 here, um, you know, uh, the Senate made some wording changes. Uh, your bill, I believe, said uh, including an action that involves criminal activity, illegal drug activity, or acts of violence, uh, any one of which seriously threaten the health or safety of other residents. So the way your B4 was written, it just verbatim tracked Title IX's language about um, 49 VSA 4467B2. Um, I think really uh, the Senate changed this just to give comfort to their colleagues that um, if there were criminal activity, 
drug activity, violence, anything else that seriously threatens the safety or the health of residents, then that could be the basis for an emergency action. Um, the bottom line is legally, this doesn't change anything. The operative piece of subdivision B4 is the first two lines. This bill does not limit a court's ability to act under AO 49, period. And everything that follows, you know, the word include or, or including as it's defined in our statutes is just an example, it is a non exhaustive list or, uh, you know, again, example of things that might count. So even though the construct, the wording is a little bit different, it's the same purpose, it's the same legal function in the end. Really, under B4, a court continues to have the ability to hear any emergency action. <clears throat> what will be an emergency action is up to the court, and it continues to be up to the court. I mean, a plaintiff will have to come and make a case to the superior court that something merits an emergency hearing. Um, and then the court will determine whether or not it will act. The rest of this criminal activity, drug activity, et cetera, those are just examples of what could constitute an emergency, but it's by no means exclusive. So again, just wanna underscore that functionally, their language is no different than your language. I think there may be a question. Yeah, Chip. There you go. Okay, so I guess uh, just a, what occurs to me is that uh, when we talk about acts of violence, uh, well, was it last year or the year before that we passed that domestic violence housing bill that restricts uh, victims of domestic violence from being evicted um, as a result of a re relief from abuse order being issued or um, uh, instances of violence uh, on the premises. Would that hold uh, up uh, with this language? I mean, I understand that it's right out of AO 49, but I guess it's just a question that I have whether domestic violence acts um, would, uh, would constitute a, 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 an eviction under AO 49 of the victim of domestic violence, let's say. It may not be an answer to that, David. <laughs> so, um. Sorry. It just so, comes no, to my mind. It's, it's good. Um, the, so those protections would continue to apply. Okay. Um, this certainly would not uh, trump okay. the statutory protections that you created for victims of abuse. Yes. Um, okay. What it would do actually uh, would, would make it harder to evict anybody. I mean, at this point, um, the uh, any landlord would have to come to the court and say i have an emergency situation on my hands i understand that you're not really holding court right now but this merits emergency action here are the grounds for my motion and for uh my ask will you do something about this and then the court will have to decide is this an emergency that merits our action notwithstanding the suspension of activities otherwise. So whether there's domestic violence involved or anything else, um, the court will be the gatekeeper to whether that action proceeds. And then if it does proceed, um, you know, all the regular landlord tenant protections that are in statute, including in that new subchapter would still apply. Okay. I mean, the likelihood of um, a no contact order as, as a result of a relief from abuse order or no contact condition uh, would likely take care of that as I'm thinking about it. So, um, I don't recall the specific scope of um, family law orders that they will hear, but if it's an emergency, that's those, those types of issues are carved out. The court said they would continue to hear Okay, Emergency. understood. Thank you, David. Sure. All right, what's next? Hmm. All right. So on page three here, 
Um, actually, the, the court suggested the language highlighted in yellow and the other parties and then the committee <laughs> agreed to it. The intention here uh, is to modify the clause, any outstanding orders, and to specify that it, it would be those orders that could lead to execution of a writ of possession against a tenant or a resident. So they didn't want to necessarily say in, in a pending action, all orders across the board necessarily have to be stayed. There could be procedural orders of other things that might be uh, necessary and that are still outstanding, but we want to be certain that if it would lead to someone being dispossessed, so if it led to the execution of a writ of possession, then those are definitely stayed. So again, just the purpose was to avoid any unintended consequences of casting too uh, broad a net and to specifically focus on outstanding orders that might lead to someone losing their, their housing. Any questions on that? All right. Um, so I, I wanna just go back up for a second here on C. So you'll see the way you guys had put this together was pending foreclosure and ejectment actions. And it said in one, upon the effective date of this act, pending actions are stayed. So if it was already filed, then when this act takes effect, it will be stayed. Okay. D addresses new foreclosure and ejectments. Um, but it says during the emergency period, you may commence an ejectment action uh, under 9 VSA 137 or a foreclosure action, but it's subject to some conditions, including that the plaintiff can only commence the action by filing. Uh, it stayed until the end of the emergency period, no service. And then once the emergency period ends, that service period will begin tolling again. So uh, Attorney Steggles email raised the concern um, that, you know, because the way D is written, it says during the emergency period and the emergency period actually dates back to March 13th, there may be some confusion about whether an action filed um, technically during the emergency period, but before this act takes effect uh, is in limbo. What, what, what exactly is the nature of that case? Does that fall under C because it's pending or does that fall under D because it's new as of the emergency period? So to, just to avoid any confusion, I would suggest that you say during the emergency period and after the effective date of this act, you may commence an ejectment action. I don't know that it's strictly necessary. I, I think that C and D set up a dichotomy of either it was pending when this act took effect or not, but to avoid any confusion about, you know, that time before this act takes effect dating back to March 13th, hopefully this would just set everybody's mind at ease that we're talking about new actions that start after this act takes effect during the emergency period. Does everybody understand the purpose here? It's a very small sort of clarifying addition that, again, I don't know that it's completely necessary, but if it sets some people's mind at ease, it's you no know, skin off my back. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. So no changes in E or in F about writs of possession, no changes to the rent escrow hearing process. <clears throat> Court still has flexibility. Um, H is the same. One thing that they did strike uh, was the exception to the notary requirement. And you may remember, I think as it left your committee, it was actually a change. It began as a change to the underlying law. Um, and then it morphed into a change only during the emergency period under which any party in an action uh, could include an attestation that 
everything they're saying in their motion or their affidavit or whatever the filing might be is true to the best of their knowledge. And if they include that attestation, then they don't have to have a notary. Um, at its final vote, the committee narrowed that even further to say only in an ejectment or a foreclosure action can someone use this attestation instead of notarization. And then on the floor, uh, Senator Sorokin offered an amendment to just strike that in its entirety. The reason is the Senate Government Operations Committee um, was bringing a much more comprehensive bill forward um, concerning electronic filing and notarization, which would uh, not only capture this, but address a, a bunch of other issues. So in deference to the work of other committees, the Senate committee took this piece out. And that's it. And David, is that Senate bill still in the Senate or is it headed over to the House? It is a fair question. I don't know the answer. I can look it up. Okay. Um, Representative Kalaki. Yes, David. Uh, I want to make sure I understand on page three, this um, during the emergency period that you, the slight change that you're recommending in, in green for us. Yes. My understanding from Chris is that the banks aren't doing foreclosures uh, and evictions right now. And my understanding from the courts is they're not doing them right now. So mm -hmm. why not keep this during the emergency period? Because we're sort of the last ones to catch up on this. And I think our legislative intent is no displacement because of COVID-19. And so we're, we should have had this some three weeks ago, this bill, you know, if it was a, in a best, best case scenario. So why not just say during the emergency period? If that's already sure. um, so the just the, the the simple reason is the way we've defined emergency period it dates back to March 13th, right? And so the concern in the with with the banks is that um, as I understand it is that they they could read that to mean there is a retroactive application, um, and specifically that if they had initiated a lawsuit by service rather than by filing. So in contravention of D1, and it was technically during the emergency period. So anytime after March 13th, but before this act takes effect. And what is the status of that case? Because D1 literally would say, you cannot start a lawsuit by service, you have to do it by filing. But that limitation will not technically take effect until this bill takes effect, which could be, you know, we're already in mid April, who knows, it could be another week. So there will be a period of four or five weeks during which they may have filed a lawsuit by service. And when this takes effect, the question will become, well, what happens to that lawsuit? Because even though at the time it was okay, now this bill read literally says we weren't allowed to do that. Again, I, I, the reason that I don't think that this is a big problem and my read is that C says pending and D says new and uh, under one VSA, section 214, our laws are prospective in their application by default, unless otherwise said in the bill. So is this green language completely necessary? I don't know that it is. Again, the whole purpose is just to give comfort to say, if you initiated an action prior to the effective date of this act, that was technically during the emergency period. Um, I mean, you're okay. You're under C. You're, you, 
it's a valid lawsuit. It stayed under C. And from the effective date of the act going forward, you'll, you're clearly under D. You can file it new, but it has to be by filing with the court. It stayed as of that filing. There's no service, et cetera. So it's really just to address that narrow sliver of cases that may have been filed since March 13th by service. Well, this may be more complicated than it's worth. You know, I, 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 I would maybe. If I could ask Chris, who's, who's I think still with us, didn't you tell us last week, Chris, that the banks aren't doing any of this? Uh, yes, but keep in mind, I think this is related to vacant property. So what we're trying to do is eliminate any confusion whatsoever from the standpoint of the, the lawyer's interpretation. Would they have to go back through the process of refiling, renotice, or whatever it may be because of the way the bill is presented now? So. I think David explained it well. They're just trying to eliminate any confusion during that period from the time March 13th to the time that this was, uh, that the bill is enacted. And again, this is related to new foreclosures during the emergency period. And again, focusing on in the earlier discussion, the vacant properties piece. Well, could, could we put vacant properties in there? Would that clarify it or be less confusing? Well, uh, I, I, I guess you could, but I don't know. I mean, everything's, <laughs> I, I can't speak to what exactly happened or was filed on March 13th to, with the courts. That would have been pre-COVID or un-COVID related. Again, not, this is recognizing that even if this were in there, we're not throwing anybody out on the streets. The courts are not going to move forward. It's just you're trying to make sure they don't have to redo all of the steps that led up to the filing during this time period to eliminate that confusion. As I read Sue Steckel's letter. Okay, I, I, I'm actually having a hard time understanding how that's in D. What's your but anyway, I guess if everyone else understands it, it's okay. I mean, we have the action of the banks that aren't doing anything. We have five of the counties, the courts aren't doing anything. And so, okay, I, I've asked my question. It's not clear. I, I, I can tell you that in Sue Steckel's letter, which is posted on your website, it's in paragraph three on the first page. Uh, and and the, la, the, well, the fifth sentence up, what happens to foreclosure complaints that were commenced by service between March 13th and, and the effective date of the bill? Will we need to serve the mortgager and all of the other defendants a second time after the emergency period ends? So again, consistent, nothing's gonna happen during this emergency period but they're questioning, do they have to repeat the process of serving uh, and other documentation uh, after the emergency period is lifted because of the difference between March 13th and the date the bill is enacted? And what have her courts in her county decided in Marshfield? What are they doing? I, I, I don't have that answer. Okay. so. This, okay. this isn't Thank really, and I understand your concern, Representative Kalaki, and this, so, so this, is, this is not um, an issue of whether a case can move forward. It can't. This doesn't change that uh, by any stretch. It just, it just seeks to break the universe into two, uh, two periods rather than three. So subsection C is anything that's pending when this act takes effect. <clears throat> and subsection D is things that are new, not pending during the emergency period. So it really, it, you want the timeline to run from anything pending until this becomes law 
and then anything after that that's new. The problem is D can be read to create a third space in the middle. And that is March 13th until this act takes effect. So since March 13th, things could have been filed. And, and, and even though they're not going to proceed because everything has stayed, they could have been filed in a way by service that is not would not be permitted otherwise under subsection D. So technically, those are pending and they fall under C um, and they should and they're stayed. But the problem is D1 raises the concern for that particular class of lawsuits, those filed by service during that particular time, March 13th until this takes effect, that they don't, there's a question whether D1 negates those lawsuits and now they have to start over. And that's really a duplication of work that doesn't have any result for the tenant because everything stayed anyway. It's just resolving the question of what is the legal status of that narrow class of lawsuits. I got it. That was very clear. Thank you. I understand it now. I appreciate it. Sure. All right, Representative Hango. Um, I think that just if it clarified it for Representative Kalaki, I was, that's good. I was just going to point out that I think we discussed this a while ago, a couple of weeks ago, and there was this concern about sort of a gray area about um, service by hand or um, by written letter. We weren't really clear about that. So I feel like if we're going to go forward with this part of the bill, that it needs to be as clear as possible. Um, and if attorney is having trouble interpreting it and we can help out in that respect, then certainly make it as clear as we can. I'm not really sure if we need to legislatively do anything, if the courts are already doing something. Um, but if we're going to go ahead with this, I think it needs to be as clear as possible. Thanks. So I don't know if it's helpful. I believe you, I know that I shared uh, with Representative Stevens and Mark Hutt and Ron, I'm not sure if it's posted, uh, a, a very short memo that I put together that just breaks out the status of, of housing related uh, matters before the court under AO 49 and then also the five units that have adopted the Chittenden County units uh, position on what will happen with these housing issues. So if you'd like me to share that with you, I can. Um, it's true that, so just in its most general terms, under the Supreme Court's AO 49, um, the courts are not hearing anything other than emergencies, basically is what they said. And then the superior courts that have adopted the Chittenden County position have put specific timelines on how long they're going to hit pause on these actions, including, for instance, 90 days on foreclosure sales. So it's true that uh, I would say for the majority of Vermont's population, most of this stuff is on pause. Um, what the bill does, though, is provides a consistent statewide framework for both ejectment and foreclosure actions. It also addresses specifically the issue of writs of possession that have been issued but not executed so that anybody in that category who may have been or may be dispossessed, notwithstanding the moratorium, will now have a pause on those writs. Um, and that's the real function. So yes, uh, Definitely, a lot of this is already addressed to the extent the courts have hit pause on their own, um, but that, that's not necessarily uh, a, a statewide standard that's consistent. And I think that's part of the reason the courts support this legislation and the work that you've done is because they do want a consistent standard across the state. Okay, more questions for David right now? 
Go ahead, uh, Lisa, can you, un if you can unmute, there you go. So I guess then my question is why have not the other courts adopted? Why only five? Um, if this is something that should be a statewide, and I, I believe it should be statewide, it should be universal. Um, so I just, I guess I'm confused about that. So the Supreme Court adopted an administrative order that said we're going to pause everything except for emergencies with a few exceptions and but it left it in the discretion of the district courts themselves to decide whether they would make exceptions to that statewide uh, pause, if you will. And, and then the, the five I'm referring to began with Chittenden County and it adopted a short order that said exercising our discretion given the circumstances here. Here's what that looks like for us. And then several other of the superior court units basically just adopted that same standard. The mm -hmm. other ones I, I haven't seen subsequent to Wyndham's adoption, whether uh, the other courts have done it as well. But um, essentially the, the second round, the first round was the Supreme Court putting a statewide pause except for emergencies and giving discretion to the superior courts. And then the second round was some of the superior courts, the most populous ones saying, here's what that looks like for us. I guess I just feel like if, um, all of the superior courts went ahead and adopted this, then we would not need this legislation. Am I correct? Uh, I mean, I, I, again, I think there are some issues that are specific here. For instance, those writs of possession that were issued but not yet executed, um, those are not specifically provided for in uh, the orders. And, um, you know, there, there's also a question of timing. I mean, right now, um, the judiciary's orders have their own definition of emergency, their own uh, determination of how long they're going to pause their activities, how they're going to manage them. And so um, while it may be consistent now with, uh, you know, what you want to see happening, they certainly could change their order. They could, they could do a different time frame. They could change the parameters. They could rescind the order. Um, so it's really, I guess the second issue is a question of, um, you know, whether you want to leave it to the judicial branch or whether as a legislature, you want to establish you know, in your capacity as a sovereign body, your own standard for what should happen. Thank you. Representative Triano. Yes. Um, Lisa, I think that that's, that speaks more to the need to uh, have this legislation to add consistency around the state when the executive, when the um, judicial branch has not provided that. So I think what we're looking at here is an attempt to say to courts, this is the way it will be done. Um, and um, it, will, uh, uh, it will approach the jurisdictions that, the, that uh, are beyond the five jurisdictions that have made these declarations. Um, in addition, I guess I'd like to go back to section one, uh, three and uh, discuss a little bit before we go too much further as to um, uh, the language here. And my thoughts are that, I mean, should we be offering language that specifically excludes uh, abandoned property and uh, or uh, non-residential property from this? Or should we work on the language that has been presented here, um, which would uh, try to define what we're talking about as uh, occupied uh, dwellings? So I guess, I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind having some discussion on that before we go too much further. <laughs> so, so, so is there a specific, what, where do you want to focus the question? Well, it's not a question. It's just, a, uh, I think we should have a discussion as to which way we would like to move on that. So, I mean, for instance, we could say, um, uh, abandoned properties um, and unoccupied properties are exempt from this, uh, some sort of language such as that, or we could uh, do some modification as Tommy and I had suggested 
surrounding uh, or uh, to focus on being sure that um, um, uh, landlords are uh, included in this uh, and um, uh, residents that are uh, occupied rather than by the borrower because um, it could be a, a house that is rented or leased in, in its entirety rather than a tenement building that would have multiple apartments. That's my thoughts. Representative Kowacki. Yeah, Chip, for me, I, what, what, what David did on the screen here when he, he edited out that longer sentence that was there and that is, that is occupied keeps it simple and focused for me. And okay. uh, I, so I, I'm comfortable with that because it's clear that it's, it's occupied property. Um, so I think that that edit, uh, when you and Tommy were talking, when David did that, like real time for us, I think it solved it for me. So I'm comfortable with where, where we are. And David, just to, for our clarification, I mean, I, I look at the phrase dwelling house and I'm and I'm assuming that that's specific to residential and not necessarily, um, that's for residential housing, not necessarily for, for commercial um, rentals. Is that, is that accurate? Let me pull that up for you. <clears throat> Um, are you seeing this 4931? Yes, that's what that's what he's referring to. I'm not seeing it yet. I'm still seeing S333. Okay. So, so, so my screen is not. Let me let me change the sh the share. Um, that I let me let me change what I'm sharing. Now I can show you. We're talking about the this now. Defined by 12 VSA 4931 section two. That's what the reference is. Yeah, that's up now, David. Good. Okay, 104. Okay, that's clear. All right. That is clear. Okay. I'll go back to the. That is occupied. So this has been just a double. This is this has been a double-edged conversation. I mean, we've gotten, we've gotten um, what has happened in the Senate, um, but we've also spent quite a bit of time with this notion about uh, foreclosures that are already occurring on vacant properties, which was the con which was the consideration of the email that we received this weekend and, and that's been shared with you. That that if I'm not where we are right now here at noon is that that situation would be dealt with with the language that David has highlighted in green. So simply this, these three words, but, and also the, uh, the language later on about effective dates. Um, is everybody clear on, on that right now? Yes. And, um, Representative Marcotte, are you? Does, do you think that this covers what we're, what we've been talking about? I, I, it looks fine to me. I I, I think that um, I think it looks fine as far as I'm concerned. Um, I appreciate the 
um, the committee's time on on having this discussion and um, making sure that um, we're taking care of the foreclosures in the right way. Okay. And where else, who else, does anyone else have anything to share or question right now on this? I mean, I think the, I think um, I have Representative Triano's hand is back up here. You're up, Chip. Chip. Well, um, I actually had lowered my hand, but I think that the language in this uh, proposal is um, clear and concise. Um, and I think that it, at this point, it does not leave a lot open for interpretation. And I think it affords the protections that we are all, we are all looking for, uh, for the citizens of Vermont against uh, being displaced uh, from a safe, uh, from their safe housing. So um, I, I'm, I'm thinking that this looks pretty good. Okay, Representative Howard. Um, yes, I, I think this is, this is adequate. I think this is um, a good bill. I've been getting questions about it um, from constituents. And um, uh, I think David did a great job. So I'm, I, I think it's fine. And I would like to see it go through as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else who we haven't heard from today? Want to chime in? I don't, I don't know if you can yep. see my hand You're raising. On. Yep. Um, uh, so I just wanted to um, echo what Representative Howard just said that I think we, um, it, as we've talked about before, this catches some potential holes, and um, and I think that's really important that we are just crystal clear in this time of crisis. So I'm I'm looking forward to moving this forward. All right, thank you, um, Representative Kalaki. Where'd you go? Hold on. Yes, a I, no, I, I think I unmuted. I think we're good. Thank you. Um, I, I, I too am very good with where we are, but I have two process questions. So now that we've taken the Senate's version of ours and the Senate passed this, and now there's an amendment, we bring the amendment whenever this moves out of our committee to the floor with our amendment, and then it has to go back to the Senate for their approval of because we've changed the bill. Is that what, what will happen? Yeah. So I mean, we can we can simply change. We can simply take the language that was proposed and and add it to make it a change in our bill, okay. just as if it were as if we were in three D, um, okay. and not have to wait to to do a separate amendment on the floor. Um, we will we would then vote on that and then and then pass it back to the Senate for their um, for their final approval. Okay. And then the second question is that I've been reading the press. Can legislators, both in the House and the Senate, who are landlords, vote on bills like this, or do they have to recuse themselves from conflict of interest? Um, the conflict of interest comes from uh, an individual conflict of interest in uh, as if the whole bill was only meant for you. I mean, and I think if if um, I mean, this is this is a common question for, for the work that we do. Um, David, do you have, David Hall, do you have a specific uh, definition of what conflict of interest is? I don't, I don't want to downplay it or get it wrong, but there, because there's a sense that um, when we, we all have, as citizen legislators, we all have separate interests and we all have um, um, uh, potential that that it may enrich us personally and um, not sure that that this crosses that line but David do you have a do you have a clearer understanding or, or a better more official definition of what a conflict of interest is I think you you've done well uh, truthfully I would defer to Bill McGill okay 
I'm sorry, I know that's not very helpful, but um, I don't want to misstate your house standards and he is the uh, best person to give you specific guidance on that question. Great. Thank no, you. That's fair enough, we can, we can ask him directly um, if, we, if we can. Um, Tommy? Yes, I, I think I can address that, uh, John. Uh, I think it was my first year in the legislature we were voting on a bill dealing with teachers' retirement. And I asked, I'm a retired teacher. So I asked that specific question, should I abstain? And the answer was no, because the bill is entire to, was dealing with a class of people, not me specifically. So I was not voting, going to be voting on a bill that says, Tommy Waltz, you're going to be getting this benefit, whether it's for a class of people. And so it should not affect uh, legislators who had landlords. I wouldn't think so. Okay. Thank you. Um, Representative Hango, can you unmute yourself? Representative Kalaki, I also asked that question last year because I sit on the board of an agency, a nonprofit agency, and the bill was specifically relating to that type of agency, and I got the same response from the clerk of the house. And as a for instance, I mean, I've been clear that for up until up until this coming Thursday, um, I've been a member of the board at Downstreet Housing and Community Development, and as hard as I fight for things like um, things like the property transfer tax, the proper use of that, et cetera. Um, I'm not being personally enriched by that. Um, and given the way that we've changed our, our ethics rules, we list our affiliations when we, when we take our oath around the same time that we, we enter each biennium. So um, it's pretty clear or it should be clear by the record where we stand. But again, I don't personally benefit by um, by advocating for better nonprofit housing um, to be built across the state. So, um, but we can certainly get a clarification from, from, um, from the clerk. I think, I think it's, um, it's, it'll, I mean, again, there are many legislators who are landlords in some way, shape or form. So um, I don't think that it, you know, it becomes a class rather than an individual issue, as Tommy was saying. I'm good to go. I, it's clear. It's clear for me. Okay. Hi, Emily. Hi, Emily. Hey. Hi, folks. Sorry for being late. I was in other meetings, but I'm here now. Do you want us to review everything we just talked about <laughs> for the last hour? No, it's on. It's being recorded, so I can review it anytime. <laughs> Sorry for. That. that's okay that's that's it that's your three o'clock to four o'clock downtime is to listen to the, the stuff that you've missed good i can find that three to four time um all right well i think we're i think i mean committee do we get a sense that we're um okay with this with the bill as it stands right now um i think it's I think I think the Senate took our work seriously and 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 made some made some tweaks to it that work. And again, what popped up, I, I totally appreciate uh, Chris Delia's comment that this is something that didn't come forward in the last several weeks because of the onslaught of of everything else that that the banking association and, and, and folks involved with this were, were looking at over the last several weeks. Um, it's actually a month now um, by the calendar anyway. And so our, but in, in terms of, um, again, we're not in a place where we can take an official vote yet until that process has been set forward by the speaker and by the house rules. So, um, I mean, are generally speaking, of, um, are we comfortable with where we are? Yes. Okay. Um, Lisa, have we, gotten most of your questions answers at, at least at this point in time are you are, I mean again we're until we actually vote it out it's not over so questions are still welcome um, as they move on but uh, but have you uh, do you feel comfortable with where we are right now yes that was a great tutorial on how the um, 
court system works and why this might be necessary in terms of timing if they change their um, change their definition or timing of the state of emergency order. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I think that is, um, I guess that's where we'll leave it for today. Um, we're scheduled for tomorrow. I'm not sure what we have for tomorrow. Um, are there things that people want to hear about if we can get a witness to discuss um, any of the any of the efforts that are being done? I know that there's some rapid response or relief um, organizations that have been set up in several in several areas. Um, do we does any do we have areas that we want to get an update on that we haven't heard from in a couple of weeks um, based on um, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things that we've heard from our constituents. Again, we talked about the construction industry. We've talked about people having issues with UI that's been ongoing and, and, and hopefully that will solve itself over the next several days with the steps that the administration and the Department of Labor have taken. Um, but there's, that's, there's little that we can work on then. Um, and not for this time and being, but I mean, it, for, Lisa, Representative Hango, I think I, I would exempt you from this part of the conversation only because you were appointed right after we finished talking about paid family leave last year. But one of the conversations that we had when we were asking the Department of Labor, well, why can't we hook this into the UI system? There was a conversation about how well we've been working with several other states on a new UI system. That partnership has fallen apart, which is um, I don't think the new system would have been in place for uh, by March 13th of this year, but um, that was really part of a conversation with paid family leave, and um, and so it, they're starting again. Uh, so it's kind of it, it'll be an interesting conversation moving forward with what the Department of Labor is it, looking to do with the UI system. Um, and if it's going to be robust enough at moving ahead. I mean, there's no system in the country that was robust enough to handle what we've been going through in the last month, um, which doesn't make it any easier for our, for our constituents. But are there any issues that people want to hear, see if we can arrange? I've got hands from uh, Representative Gonzalez. Go ahead. Can yeah, you um, thank you. Yeah, so I uh, would love to hear um, from some folks around how people who are experiencing homelessness, um, what the, the shift in services, I know that it's agency by agency and, and different things. Um, but that is something that I would, I would love to, to get some knowledge um, about how, what the status of things are. So would that be from a service provider or from the agency? <laughs> Um, I think if the, if the agency feels like they have an overview that they could offer us, um, but again, I know that they're you know, very busy, so I don't, I don't know exactly. I don't have a specific request, so more um, if people have ideas around who to invite, but I, uh, I know people have been asking about wanting to make sure that folks are being taken care of who are experiencing homelessness prior to this, and then also um, with the situation where some folks won't, wouldn't be able to self-isolate in where they live. And so then what, what are their options? And with Goddard not being a site anymore, um, but then what are the options for folks if, they, if their housing situation is not um, stable enough for them to, or it's not, it's, oh, it's not um, roomy enough uh, for them to be able to self-isolate, what are some other options? So two things that are separate, but combined. So to that, I mean, I think in central Vermont, there is, and I believe Chittenden County, I've seen ads in seven days for the same type of organization, which is, which is the rapid response. Um, in our case, it's Washington County, a bit of Loyal County, a bit of Orange County, which are the service areas of both Downstreet and Capstone, which is the CAP agents, the, the community action agency. Um, if they have been organized in a way, in a response category, along with the Department of Health, to provide a lot of those services. So perhaps if we can find someone from there, is that is that just, I mean, that's not gonna be, a, I, I think that's gonna give us a, a, a little bit higher up 
on the, mm-hmm. on the elevation rather than someone who's running a, a homeless um, shelter like Good Samaritan in central Vermont um, or, or Cots in, in Burlington. But maybe we can start with that if, I, if we can get someone to testify on a short, short notice. Yeah, that would uh, we'll, be great. We'll take a look there. Thanks, Matt. Um, I actually had a question for Chair Marcotte, but he took off. So <coughs> if he comes back, I'll. Oh, there he is. Hey. Hey, how are you? Um, it's kind of an unre- quick question, just uh, related to UI that popped up with a constituent yesterday. <clears throat> so their son works under um, 10 hours a week, so doesn't qualify for UI state benefits. Does that still disqualify them from the $600 federal um, allocation on top of that? I, I believe so, because in order to get the 600, you have to qualify for state okay. unemployment, I believe. I, I kind of thought that would be the answer, but I just wanted to affirm it a little bit. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right. Um, Representative Kalaki. Can you unmute yourself? There you yes. go. Uh, it's similar to Representative Gonzalez. In, um, I'm interested to see what's happening with our homeless population because it's just been announced in South Burlington that the Hilton, one of the, one of the hotels, is actually going to house people as a re- who are, who don't have homes to as they recover from this. So that and it's it's a lot of people are saying so. What's happening with this population? How are we protecting them? So I think it, if we your ex, your examples, chair, would be fine. It doesn't have to be in Chittenden County, but just to get our, our grasp of. You know, we, we moved a lot of people out of the shelters in Chittenden County. They went into hotel rooms to, to be safer. Uh, and then those that are sick are now going to be moved into this um, Hilton. Uh, in, but how big a, an issue is this in our state? That would be great if we could get the integrated well, service model. And is that, is that, do you know what organization is doing that? Is that COTS? Is that, is that Champlain Housing Trust? Do you know? Um, you know what? I will go. It was in Digger. I, I'll look it up as, as we're talking and I'll come back in and let you know. Okay. So, no, I, I mean, it would be good to know. I mean, Chittenden County obviously has a density that's far greater than, than most other places in the state. But nevertheless, that's, um, and they do it with a different, slightly different style, I think, just because of that, than, than, um, than, uh, uh, than here in central Vermont or, or in any other, other counties that, we, that we've heard from in the past. Um, Representative Hango. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the chat just now, but Representative Zott said he thinks it's the Holiday Inn and not the Hilton in South Burlington, which is what I thought also, but then I thought maybe the Hilton's also doing it. Um, but that wasn't what I was going to suggest. I've been trying to listen in once in a while when Senate Economic Development and Housing have their meetings. And it's kind of hard with my schedule to hear a lot of what they're hearing, but I find it somewhat helpful, especially when they have housing folks coming in, talking to them. And this morning their, their discussion started with a plan of how they were going to try to use federal monies. And I missed a lot of it. But I think that would be interesting going forward to hear how we're going to use the money from the federal government, which isn't even here yet, um, or how we're thinking of using those monies for housing. Um, Also, uh, Treasurer Pierce gave a presentation this morning, which is on Mm -hmm. Senate Economic Development's um, website, which is quite interesting. So I don't know if we can do more with them since we have limited meeting times um, and that would help administration officials who are being asked to testify in multiple places. Sure, and I I think um, maybe Ron, if you hit the phones after this meeting and find out from maybe from Sean Brown or Sarah Phillips, if who would be the best if they're even available, I don't know if we need to go um, do people remember, do we need to go through um, our liaison or is there a specific liaison that we talk to uh, in order to request time from the administration? Um, there, there is, and uh, they're all kind of swamped, but mm-hmm. I'll, um, I'll see what we can do. I also have that email from um, Sue Minter and Eileen Pelt, uh, uh, Peltier. 
Oh, yeah. Thank you. From last week where they talked about the um, consolidated work they're doing um, right. in Washington County. So if you want to chat for a minute afterwards, we can formulate the question we want to ask and I can send it out to likely folks. Yeah, no, I, I think I think it would be I think that would be good if we can and if we can reach someone. I, it, I mean, it's easier for me to think of central Vermont, but I think hearing from Chittenden County as well or other parts of the state <clears throat> they're available it's very short term it's a very short notice i understand but um that would be ideal the other thing um in an email correspondence i had with jen holler from vhcb she did mention that the money like we put five million dollars as a placeholder and, and and there's still no number that that that's no one can work with with any kind of confidence. Um, people have been making estimates that are that are twice that, but um, in terms of long term, perhaps through the end of the year. But the um, what Jen Holler mentioned was that out of the federal money, some of the, the, the she calls them ESG grants, and I think they're emergency services grants that usually go through the Agency of Human Services or um, would be used for the for the purposes that we had delineated in our draft legislation. So, um, but, but I think, I think these other sources would, would have that information as well. So, so Ron and I will check that out and we'll, we'll get a schedule out to people as soon as we possibly can um, this afternoon so that you're prepared for, for um, some work tomorrow. And we're on at one, 1 PM. Yes, we are one to three. All right, and that would be so. Are these two times um, this eleven to one and and one to three on Wednesdays? Is this if um, does this still work for people next week if we do the same time frame? Okay, and again, um, I think we're I think we can say we're pretty much done for today. So if you do have other suggestions, um, please email Ron and I and Ron and me and um, we'll see what we can find for tomorrow. And then again, look to your emails about the schedule for the training for the um, Zoom and Everbridge voting, you know, what it's gonna be like on the floor. Um, those are, that should be in your legislative email box. So anything else for today? Good to see everybody. Um, it's remarkable how many, we all choose the same backgrounds. I've been noticing that. So, um, I tried to change it up, but just didn't feel right. I just um, got a green screen. So I'm figuring it all out. So we'll have some fun soon. I don't have, I don't have the uh, bandwidth to, uh, do a background change. I, well, so, my computer's old enough that, that apparently it's not, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't work quite the same. I kind of, I kind of oh, right. yeah. think that we're we're looking at what what Angela Zakowski had, where she had the different placards, you know, just behind yeah. her. You know, it wasn't even a green screen; it was a very professionally done um, look. So, um, all right. Oh. So, I, again, I'll, I'm going to hang out and talk to Ron for a minute. So, good to okay. see everybody. Yeah. Um, we'll be adjourned. Thanks. Thank okay. you, everyone. Right. I'm ending the live stream. <laughs>